Learning unplugged, learning unplugged, learning unplugged, learning unplugged. Hello and welcome to Learning Unplugged. My name is Lucy and this is Kate. And today we're here to talk about professionals and education and learning um, different styles of being parenthood and a loads of range of topics. So welcome. Would you like to start by saying a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm Kate Ferguson. I'm a lecturer at the University of the West of England. And I'm also a mum to a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Um, and I'm also undertaking a PhD at the moment at the University of the West of England, so I'm a part-time student myself. Oh, well, that's so cool. So kind of how did you get into doing that? Oh, well, it was a bit of a long journey. My undergraduate degree was in politics. Um, and so I ended up working on Parliament Hill in Canada, where I'm from, for a few years uh, before realizing that I was really interested in political marketing. This was before Trump and social media <laughs> in the United States. So I came over to Bristol with my husband to do an under or to do a master's degree at UWE in marketing. And I planned to take that back to Canada and do a plan of political marketing, but I ended up teaching marketing. Yeah. So that's how I got to where I am. Are you enjoying that? Yeah, I love teaching. I have always enjoyed teaching. My parents were both teachers and I always said I'd never become a teacher, <laughs> even though I really enjoyed it. I, I was trying to do something different, but I think, yeah, it caught up with me in the end and I really enjoy working with students and young people. Good, how long have you been doing that? At, um, um, I've been teaching at UE since 2012. So yeah, so a decade That's a long now. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good that you're still enjoying it though. I'm not sure I could teach for that long and yeah. still enjoy it. So yeah, yeah, yeah that's so cool. So how did you kind of um, know that kind of marketing was what you wanted to do? How did you kind of figure that one out? Um, well, I guess I was working in politics at the time and I was really interested in the concept of marketing. I think there were some books on the market. I used to go to our local chapters bookstore and read about new marketing titles. And I, it was something I wanted to get into. So I took a course at a local college online and that stimulated some interest and decided I wanted to do more than that. So I think the Mad Men series, do you remember that was out at the, at the moment? And there was, a, there's probably two yeah, old I think I'm a bit young. <laughs> and uh, there was a lot on the, about like, like working at ad agencies. And I thought that would be really sexy and cool. And I never yeah. got there, but I ended up doing something I think that I enjoy even more. So. Yeah, I know that's good. I mean, sometimes life doesn't go exactly how we planned, but yeah. the way that you kind of made something out of that, that you're obviously enjoying. Yeah. I think is, is the whole point of that. So yeah, I would definitely yeah. would agree. So kind of in your kind of role as an educator, how would you kind of say that influences young people? Like either in university setting or kind of at, at your children's age kind of thing. Like the, the marketing thing or? Yeah, marketing or like education. Um, well, I think just having like life experience and having been through different forms of education is really useful. I mean, especially in today's climate where we've got some teaching online, um, that was really useful, I mean, years ago to do these correspondence degrees and work through a local college online. That was really eye-opening for me as a user of education to see what it's like. I know that a lot of our students had to work online through the pandemic and that was really challenging for us as educators and for them to adapt to a new way of learning and teaching. But I'd say on the whole, I've come out with it, of it with a lot more skills and we sort of axed a lot of the things that weren't working in a traditional classroom setting anyways, and we're trying to harness the things that really work well. Yeah. yeah. How did you find kind of online learning? Like, I have a, did you, were you doing your PhD kind of at that time? Or? No, I just started a PhD last year. So I've only oh, okay. done it a year part time. So that's been, I mean, I say that's been in person, but then I forget how the, much the world has yeah. changed because I can't say that I've met my, all my supervisors face to face. Yeah, and that's yeah, just the imagine. reality of teens now, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, I enjoyed adapting to teaching online. I actually found it really invigorating. There were different platforms that we could use um, in terms of like polling and quizzing and getting people to contribute into forms of chat or you know, whiteboards that weren't necessarily possible in a lecture theater. And so it was interesting experimenting with some of those tools. Do you think that's kind of gained them more skills as well? Kind of the whole online and learning how to learn online. Do you think yeah. that's kind of developed them in a, in a well, sense? Well, I haven't looked too much at that, but you raise a really good point. I think in terms of professional skills, it's probably really valuable for them because they were almost thrust into having to be on camera and whether you're using Teams or whether you're collaborating with people over, you know, um, 
different types of platforms, I think learning how to work together with people online yeah. and that sort of social etiquette online. I guess that is now just a part of the workplace, isn't yeah, it? It's, yeah. it's that the, a lot of companies go into hybrid working and say so you'd work yeah. three days a week and the yeah. other two you work at home and yeah. you would have to interact with people online. You'd have to have those meetings. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's definitely something that they've would have learned through the pandemic because that's one thing that we can take from it anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you want to tell me a bit more about your PhD? I'm really interested in that. Yeah, I'd love to. I love my PhD research. I'm um, looking into actually knife carrying and knife carrying in Bristol. Oh, right. Yeah, so the way that I got to that point was I started uh, in lockdown, actually. I wrote a module on behaviour change and social marketing. And I was looking for tutorial examples, like for case studies of things that we could look at in sessions that would be interesting, that we could apply behaviour theory and tools to. And I, there were a lot of stabbings in the news that summer. Um, and I thought, oh, knife crime. I wonder, um, I'm sure that social marketers have done loads of work on social marketing and knife crime. So I'll have a look. And I couldn't find really anything at all. So I raised it with a colleague of mine who's a professor of social marketing and who is now my supervisor. And um, he said he hadn't seen anything, but he was sure that there was something out there. And so I accidentally stumbled across a topic, of course, which is very under-researched. Um, particularly, there's a massive hole, I suppose, around how we evaluate whether knife interventions are working and how and right. why they work. And so the crux of my PhD is I'm going to be examining how and why a knife intervention helps young people to stop carrying a knife. Right, wow, that's so yeah. interesting. Yeah, how did you kind of, like, I don't know, kind of pick that up rather than obviously being like, oh, I'm a mum, I teach as well. How did you kind of find oh, the time yeah. to be able to write a PhD? Is well, crazy. I haven't written it yet. <laughs> um, but I think um, what really inspired me, I think when you, you know, when you become a parent, your whole mind sort of shifts over. And I suppose in reading some of those news headlines, like anybody else, you sort yeah. of think about like what school your kids are going to go to and like the day that you're going to have to let them go out at night or go to the park mm -hmm. or be hanging out downtown or whatever. And what sort of a society do I want my kids to be growing up in and, and how can I help? And so that was sort of the, where it started for me, but I think um, the PhD came up because my youngest, if anybody in the parent out there, went to school, and um, yeah, I all of a sudden was faced with having a bit more time. So I reduced my hours to part-time, just to working three days a week when my children were babies, because I wanted to spend two days of the week with them. And then once my son entered school last September, I thought I could either put my feet up and have more time <laughs> or I could work hard and have more money. But instead, I made the very silly decision <laughs> of not getting any more time or any more money, but um, doing the PhD. But I think it's a good investment in my future career and in me, actually, personally. It's yeah. nice when you're a parent to also have things that you're working on just for yourself. Yeah. And um, even though it's challenging and difficult, it's... Um, rewarding yeah no I, I imagine like that kind of topic is so timely as well in this kind of society at the moment yeah. unfortunately obviously yeah. um is there kind of any findings that you can share with us um, um, so far or? well do you know I'm just in the early stages I'm probably in the first of probably what's going to be four maybe five years to my husband's dismay <laughs> um of study but I can say that I've learned a lot from like reading around the literature and from and scoping out, um, just in town, I, I've had lots of really interesting meetings with like police officers and social workers and different people running interventions in the city. And what I've learned has been a lot actually around empathy and I think the importance of understanding the other person and their perspective. And that's been hugely valuable for me across a range of different life areas. Um, so actually the, the type of research method that I'm planning to use is something called phenomenology, which is just like a big fancy word for um, trying to understand another person's perspective with empathy, so seeing the world almost through their eyes. Because knife carrying is a behaviour that doesn't really make sense to someone who might be a police officer or a parent like myself. We tell young people that if they carry a knife that they're more likely to be killed by it. Actually, you're very likely to have your own knife turned on you by someone who's more experienced and die as a result of carrying your own knife, which is so ironic. And we tell young people this through social marketing campaigns, and yet they still continue to carry. So there's something that we're not, I think, fundamentally understanding about how they see the problem and why they feel unsafe yeah. and why they feel the need to carry. And so it's all about getting into, I think, that young person's like mindset 
and um, motivations for their own behavior. And that's helped me hugely, I'd say, in my marriage and in how I try to connect with my children because, you know, now when they come home and tell me something that's happened at school that's been a negative experience for them, I think I'm less quick to judge, less quick to give, hopefully, you know, <laughs> quick advice or pat yeah. answers and more willing to, you know, get down and into the depths of it with them and, and try to ask some good questions. And I think it's that understanding and that empathy that young people, especially in today's, you know, technology full society, I think are missing is that in some ways that face to face sort of empathy and understanding. Yeah. And, and a lot of that is, is part of education. We find that um, young people who are excluded from mainstream education are particularly vulnerable to knife carrying. There's something really special, I think, about the mm -hmm. school environment and about, you know, face to face, one to one, or, you know, I know in our school system it's more like 15 or 30 to one. But being around, I think, other human beings, that was really lacking in the pandemic, wasn't yeah. it? And in lockdown. And yeah, it's just nice to be back in person and um, as a community, really, just interacting with one each other, each other again. And that's so important for our young people. Yeah, I completely agree. I think yeah. that kind of, and learning the psychology kind of behind it, that's something that really interests me, is the yeah. kind of the psychology of how we think. I think when you understand that, and especially kind of through your findings, that you can, and once you obviously share that with yeah, everyone, yeah. is that we can kind of, as individuals, think about, oh, okay, that's why they're doing that, or that's, become something because they've thought of that and kind mm -hmm. of that kind of psychological way of thinking I think yeah. as you said about the empathy like mm -hmm. I think that that kind of can contribute to society and bettering society and hopefully decreasing these kind of situations where mm -hmm. people feel the need to knife carry and yeah. other things like that I think yeah 100% yeah. that's something yeah that, um, yeah it's really good but yeah perfect yeah. so kind of touching on what you said um, how do you think kind of education in that kind of classroom environment, the one-on-one -on -one human interaction, how do you think that's going to kind of change in the future? Mm -hmm. And like, is there anything by being an educator yourself or a parent, like things that you think that are going to change for the better, for the worse? And yeah, no, that's a really good question. I mean, I think personally, there's always going to be a struggle or a bit of a strain um, and a, a mismatch between resource and and what we're able to achieve and how we're able to connect with young people. Um, and that's a struggle uh, in the university sector as well. I mean, this year universities are, are facing, um, in some cases, major deficits because we don't have as much funding as we've had in previous years. And so the challenge is always like, how do we resource something to make it a meaningful learning experience for our, our users? Um, all I can say is, I guess, flexibility, creativity, and um, you know, we have to make the most of what, what we're given. And the pandemic was a really good example of sort of how we have, were forced in some ways to pivot to a system that we were unfamiliar with. And yet there were still some good things to come out of it. So I'm not sure that I have any answers for you really. One of the, the key items that universities are facing at the moment is the challenge of what to do with AI. Um, yeah, and, such a big upcoming thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, we're all going to need to figure yeah. out like how we navigate that one. I know that at master's level, that like for example, our dissertations, we no longer have students submit uh, written dissertations, so there's no thesis this year at master's level, just because we were getting so many um, bot essays, there were so many assessment offenses, yeah. um, and people using AI to generate um, materials and we just cannot assess that so i suppose the challenge is one of the challenges we're facing is um, authentic assessment and genuine assessment and and how do you tell you know if a student has internalized learning and knowledge um you know is a thesis or is an exam still the best way to assess that yeah. or can we be creative about how we um yeah tap into how much a young person knows and so that's been the challenge for us. I mean, the, the sector is going to be reading from that one. I've seen models where universities like in Bath, they're trialing helping students you know, to use AI in their assessments because yeah. as a marketing practitioner, you're likely to be using AI now oh, yeah, in order to so. generate you know, your material. And, and it just makes sense. And so if our students are going to be using AI in a professional setting, What's our role in teaching them how and when and where to use it and how are we going to continue to assess their knowledge in a way that's productive for us? I think that's such a good point. I think, I mean, if more kind of educators and 
um, kind of universities, schools actually helped the students use AI. Yeah. I think it's such a big part and it is such an upcoming thing mm -hmm. that it is going to be used in every kind of walk of life at some yeah. point in time. And yeah. if you haven't prepared your students for that, yeah. then nothing, it won't progress. It won't, yeah. You won't learn how to do it. And like you said, you will just get assessments that have just been absolutely recited yeah. through kind of chat GPT yeah, and those yeah. kind of things. And I'm writing my own PhD thesis, wondering like, <laughs> exactly. well, what, is, what does AI mean for me? So yeah. we're all sort of grappling with the exactly. same question. Yeah. yeah, I think if you kind of support the students through using it, I think that's yeah. definitely the kind of thing. So what kind of, um, you said kind of um, in the masters, they're uh, kind of changing it to not be a dissertation anymore. What are they kind of coming up with instead? Uh, oh, do you yeah. think that's going to kind of change for obviously like lower down school, like going all the way down to kind of primary school? Like how oh, do you think it's going to yeah, change? Yeah, no, that's some really good questions. I mean, I've got some really great colleagues who are doing a fabulous job um, of trying to put together how we're going to address this across the whole business school. So it's quite a lot of effort that goes yeah. in. Um, I was just in a briefing this morning and what it looks like is that we're going to have um, a series of like workshops where people can come and learn but then everyone will be assigned a mentor as well right. and that mentor is meant to check in on them once every couple of months sort of like a dissertation supervisor would have done. Um, they're going to need to submit more points of work more frequently, but they'll be shorter bits. Right. So, for example, instead of a literature review, you'd submit um, a list of your 14 top most helpful references that right. you've read and identified with and loved and want to shape into your research. So I think the, the work that's submitted is going to be a lot shorter. And then the end product is actually a viva. We're not calling it a viva because students sometimes freak out when they're in Viva <laughs> because they think that they've, they've been found guilty of an assessment yeah. and need to defend themselves or something. So I'm not sure what word they're actually thinking of using, but it's going to be some sort of an oral discussion. Okay. And they'll okay. have like two people sit down with them, you know, two of my colleagues and one student, and they'll have a discussion about their research because it's meant to be a piece of research in the end. So what was their question? You know, what sources did they rely on to inform the research that they were performing? Um, what data they collected and what they found out. And, and that's sort of at the heart of what any dissertation is supposed to be. It's just, it's very difficult for us to tell when someone's bought data or yeah. hired someone to write the thesis for them. And so I guess it's, it's helping us to focus on like, what are the main components of what we want our students to be learning while they're with us at UE and, and how can we assess those components in a way that's fair and, um, yeah, and, and helpful for, for all yeah. of us. Yeah. I guess that kind of kind of turn, ties into like learning styles as well. Yeah. Because I mean personally I hate exams. Can't do them. <laughs> Would never do them. I can sit there and write an essay, no issue at all. Yeah. But personally for me, exams can't do it. And so yeah. you have those obviously those different learning styles between exams, coursework, um, written, oral, different mm -hmm. kind of communication and different ways of presenting your information. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think that's something that could probably in increase inclusivity yeah. of students in general. Yeah, yeah. I think that's definitely a really good way. Well, yeah, that was the other justification for um, a just like a verbal viva was the, what we call the attainment gap in higher yeah. education. And also, um, we've got a lot of the sector, a lot of our students are international students where English is a second language. And so assessing people on a, on a written piece yeah. of assessment isn't necessarily, um, yeah, capturing what they know yeah, their knowledge, because, yeah. yeah they they come to us from a different um a different country with a different language and so by the hope i suppose is that by having these these smaller submissions and and more dialogue i suppose it's more of a two-way assessment than a, a one-way like yeah here's my dissertation yeah. um that we'll all get more out of it we'll have to see i'm sure that we'll have to be refining the process from yeah. here no i'm sure it will be a long long kind of journey but oh yeah it sounds yeah. really interesting yeah. So we're just going to finish off on our podcast here. Thank you so much for joining. Um, so we're just going to le leave with a final message, a top tip that you have for kind of to take away from this podcast. Oh, yeah. Well, I think what keeps coming back um, to me over and over again is this idea of empathy and understanding the learner's perspective. So I think I just emphasize that I'm someone who grew up actually um, in Suzuki Method. I don't know if you're familiar with the no. Suzuki Method. <laughs> I did Suzuki Violin. I'm trying to teach my daughter Suzuki Violin at the moment, which isn't going as well as I'd hoped. She doesn't <laughs> like listening to me. Um, but I think one of the brilliant things about Suzuki that I was thinking, reflecting on the other day is that you're always thinking and reviewing what you already know, 
we call this like scaffolded learning and then um, practicing what you're learning at the moment and looking to the future continually about where we're going next. So in the Suzuki method, you're always listening to the songs that are going to be coming up, you know, and in the next week, months, years from now. Um, and I think that perspective is, is really, really valuable is how do we like support students and know exactly where they're coming from and be able to assess sort of where they've been and where they're going and guide them sort of gently through that that process. Um, a lot of yeah stuff lately, um, whether it's funding changes, resource changes, COVID, learning online has been really abrupt. And yeah. I think there's a gentleness and a tact to like how we encourage young people along this journey, with, which, you know, let's face it, isn't easy. No, definitely. Yeah. I can vouch for that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank yeah. you for watching. And we'll see you soon on the next episode of Learning Unplugged. Goodbye. Learning unplugged, learning unplugged, learning unplugged, learning unplugged.